All right. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for being here again. We are going to get into our next conversation, which I have the great honor um, of introducing um, curator um, Allison Glenn uh, from the Counterpublic 2023 Curatorial Ensemble. So thank you, Allison. Um, artist Damon Davis, whose work is on view um, at City Park in the Brickline Greenway uh, with the permanent um, installation Pillars of the Valley and also a film commissioned and premiered on Friday evening. Um, it is on view at 2626 Cherokee Street. Um, thank you, Damon. Um, artist Turquoise Dyson, uh, who I've had the great privilege of working with um, uh, throughout Counter Public to realize her largest work to date, um, a piece called Bird and Lava uh, for Scott Joplin. It is on view for the next three months at St. Louis Place Park. Please do experience it. It is a true stunner. And finally, to uh, David Ajay, who, whose work will be realized in public view on site at the Griot Museum of Black History throughout Counter Public uh, and will open uh, prior to our exhibition's close. So, uh, it's my job to get out of the way and let these people talk to each other because uh, we're in for quite a treat. So thank you for being here and thank you all. Thank you, James. So we were told to, yes, actively grab the mics. Good morning. How is everybody? To start, I just, I want to thank you all for being here. And I'm, I feel super honored to be in dialogue together. Um, I think a great place for us to begin would be to just briefly explain your work for Counter Public. And there's a few questions or provocations I have around that. And we'll start with you, Damon. So the question is, you know, each of your works engages with the histories of the sites that you're working at. What is your relationship to those histories? And how do they manifest within the formal, conceptual, or material choices that you've made? Um, well, I think so. From the start, the uh, the one piece, the permanent uh, the permanent monument, Pillars of the Valley, it started about four to five years ago. I was working on it, so um, love the counter pub counter public, but it wasn't in my purview, so to speak, when I when I started working on it. And the uh, so so the elements of time were. I guess it wasn't like a, a commission. So, so the time, the time, and the way that I was thinking about it was specifically for the, for the histories that were lost in uh, Mill Creek. The the people that were there, um, it was a black community, and I was I was just thinking about the fact that they were displaced, and so it was a purposeful erasure of history or, or covering up. So, the, so what I was trying to do was trying to come up with a way to, in in space, in physical space. Uh, I guess make something that would honor, vindicate, validate those stories, and uh, bring back the excavate is the best way I could put it. Like almost like archaeologists uh, uncover histories that were purposely covered. So I think that at least that's what I, that was my goal with uh, Pillars of the Valley. And how did you realize that with material choices? Uh, for one thing, the the initial idea was supposed to be um, using actual physical soil from where we where we sat to do it but it was it was yeah I, I had a whole lot of dreams and the architects let me know that I, you know that might not work bro so I had to figure out different ways to uh to to uh get that idea across so what we ended up doing was choosing limestone which is also a rock that's indigenous to uh St. Louis and specifically that part of St. Louis so that is what the capstone is but uh initially uh I had a lot of ideas that didn't exactly work. So that's that's specific around around the material. Um it's from it's it's literally the ground itself. So again, back to excavating the ideas. That's a really nice connection. I actually am gonna ask David to speak to this idea of excavation and limestone and and maybe pushing beyond it or, or ideas you had and how it's shifted with your work. Sure. No, it's um uh, again the same same sort of encounter. Mine was about a kind of really thinking about the Grio as a site and and working with um, the, the history that's sort of been consolidated in that building and thinking about the connections of that history to its deep past and, and also its potential future. So mine is a kind of um, an, an imagining of um, 
the, the, the space around the griot no longer just being a sort of front and back, but a sort of a landscape that starts to emanate um, a relationship with people and the context, and one that really uses the cylindrical forms as a way to remember the sort of first sort of geometries of architecture on the continent of black people. Um, and so it's a kind of fragment that's trying to kind of play with that. With that. So in a way, mine's kind of looking at sort of deep history, deep time. Um, and then sort of moving forward. But again, you know, I'm an architect in my day job. <laughs> and uh, um, yes, the soil issue, because what's, what you find, what you realize about St. Louis is that it's, it's almost, it's what it was and what it is now are very different. And so there are many geologies. And so in what we were trying to do, uh, it started off as just trying to kind of literally bring the earth up, but then transformed into really understanding the hybrid nature of the soil and the hybrid nature of the landscape. So, this, so the idea of the soil of the bricks that were made, you know, with sort of iron rich brick, um, sort of recycling, upcycling those, crushing those and restarting, finding where soil deposits are in the region and bringing those, because that's the soil is the soil. You know, our geographic dimension is nothing to do with what the Earth's <laughs> sort of relate, you know, ability to kind of make soil. So understanding the soil from the region and then also the limestone. So it's a kind of composite is what we've managed to kind of get to, to achieve these cylindrical systems. So it's a kind of translation, but also a very specific relationship to, to the place. Yeah. And Torquoise, I'd say materially, the way that that resonates with your work is through the sonic intervention that your sculpture makes. And I'd love for you to speak to that. Sure. My challenge was really trying to figure out syncopation in the ways in which Scott Joplin was a genius at that. So the research was really in relationship to an inventor, a technology that he used called the piano. And the idea of syncopation is also a form that black people tend to exist in pretty organically. So that was running simultaneously. Uh, my research with Scott Joplin and his work sort of ran parallel to the sort of poetic work that I was doing with painting and drawing. So the challenge was to create an amalgamation of the two. And so, yeah, sound became material and space became material. So what came out of that, I think are geometries that are really necessary for through ways and improvisations and pathways to really exhaust the possibility of syncopation. And I think intervention probably wasn't the right way to describe your work. It's more of a, a engagement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I'd love to also speak a bit about the body, right? When I walked into your sculpture, I had the luxury of being one of two people in there. Um, and, and at every turn, my body was engaging with form and sound in different ways. How should someone be navigating that space? Or is there, what are you thinking about with someone navigating that space and what is the intention with the body? So one thing about considering how one creates a form and imagining Scott Joplin creating ragtime leaf, I really sort of sunk into this idea of solitude. And as a painter, I spend most of my time in solitude. So the, the quadrilateral spatial sound installation was really based on individual sort of feeling the bass, right? Feeling the kind of drawing that I was doing in the space. Um, so it was a matter of how do you create a system that is discursive and visceral and allow um, a sort of also a physical syncopation, but also to produce a sort of organic syncopation through desire. Like I want people to sort of walk behind the piano walls. I want them to desire to sit in the center. And I wanted the way the sound moves through the space um, to make people really curious about how I might exist there or there or there. So um, that was the way I think about um, people, you know, really experiencing, experiencing it with groups of people and really individuals. Like, let's be in solitude, you know, and then let's 
be in the space of sociality and both be uh, generative experiences. I felt that. And the center stools are also movable. Right. So one of the things about listening and thinking through Scott Joplin is the idea of how do you achieve um, that kind of sound condition. And Keith, you can speak to this as well. Like, how do you hear someone's hand like, pound on a piano, and then the other hand doing something paradoxical, you know? Um, and I think I learned a lot from Keith and Mindy, having things simultaneously in multiple places at the same time. Um, but those stools are a way to pick up something and move something somewhere else and just move it an inch or move it across. And the idea of modularity is also, modularity, syncopation, improvisation have to exist to, to really produce a discursive condition or a dialectical condition. So, you know, how do you, how do you make something that's once a container about and of and for black people who have conditions of enclosures that they still need to liberate inside of, right? So those things need to operate um, for that, in that potential, right? They just happen to be boxes, but they could be ball, they could be whatever. Absolutely. I really appreciate that question and I'd love for both David and Damon to answer as it relates to the work that you you're working on here. Could you could you ask the question one more time? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> so Torquaze, the question that you asked was, um, you know, how it, as it relates to Black people and thinking about space and time and environment. That's how I understood it. But please elaborate if there is something that perhaps I've missed. No, not at all. I think that one of the things about why we're all here to think about something that you um, are contributing to sort of hyper-capitalist condition, this idea of the fixed, and this idea of dispossession, and this idea of erasure, both um, in, in fixed ontologies. And if David's proposition is that, that these geometries are from an ancient continental discursive diverse space, and then we live in a racial capital that claims these geometries as somehow autonomous, that the refusal of that must be one that is operates on different registers, right? So absolutely. The question is how do you well my question continues to be, how do you produce a condition that refuses that on multiple levels? How do you push a condition to say, no, I'm righteous, that's it, that's where I belong, and move on about your business, you know? <laughs> well, um, I think you said it. I mean, I, I, I think it's about, I mean, I, I wake up every morning, and it would, black people, we wake up in America, we, we, we didn't, a lot of us didn't have a choice to be here, um, and and I think a lot of it is about survival and resilience and not in the way, you know, now is, is, that's supposed to be cool to say, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and I don't think that we should, uh, we should praise being punished and being able to take a whole lot of punishment. But I do know that uh, my family for generations has survived and it's, a, and it's because, and, and the only reason I'm up here sitting in, in front of y'all talking to all these people is because of generations and generations of sacrifice have culminated in me. So I, so I understand that. And I think that that, when you talk about rhythm and you talk about mute, like that's, that's us doing that, bobbing and weaving and, and, and surviving. And so when I was thinking about my, um, my piece, I really wanted to remember that somebody was here and somebody was moved out of here. And then making sure that nobody ever forgets that history of those people, right? So, so the, bit, the, the best way to do that was to make something as big as possible that, and, and something that towered over people to make sure that they have to confront the histories that's, that's been here. So, um, and, and hopefully, people that haven't even been born yet, little black kids will, will walk up to that thing and by knowing that somebody, people were here and they survived. So that means that those people created me so I will survive. I think that's a part of that waking up righteous. I think that that's, that's the, and that's the only way to do it. And um, 
yeah, I think that that's something not totally unique to black people in America, but but um, we got we we very much experienced in how to survive in that in that sort yeah, of that's, that's belonging, right? Yeah, you want to make sure belonging continues. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and this this conversation is is like the sort of you just lit a fuse. <laughs> to quasi. <laughs> Uh, it's it's beautiful to watch uh, the uh, the action striking, <laughs> um, but you know I think that this whole c question of how do how do black bodies exist in space in the world is is the fundamental question that we're all wrestling with after you know colonization and enslavement and then a sort of integration and what is integration and then also what is what is the luxury of just production. Right? What, what is the luxury of just being who we are rather than going through the lens of other things that we've been forced to accommodate? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm sort of, in my work, I'm very interested in imagining always that freedom, mm -hmm. right? So, so how, do you, how do you just perpetually create a resistance by imagining freedom? And, it's, and that's the resistance. The resistance is to, to not for me anyway, I mean, I think there are many paths, but for me is to not, um, to not consolidate that trauma into the process of expression, but to always seek a way in which one can try to find oneself mm -hmm. and to have a luxury of being able to then speak to oneself in, in the act of creating, because ultimately that's the most powerful thing that we can do is to just contribute to the fact that we're, we're human beings on this planet <laughs> and we have, as human beings, the right to express ourselves, right? So then, you know, for me then also, the question of our ancestral history is not just historical, it's, it's, it's almost like a sort of imperative of the DNA to understand how you know, because essentially to be human is to be a kind of a, a reborn body through the cell regeneration, right? So we are reborn so many times, so we are basically encoded histories. So if we're encoded histories, we're not just about our individuality, we're about the sum of the experience of being human beings in the world. So surely there has to be some merit in history beyond history. It, it is a kind of fundamental DNA of who we are. So for me, you can't, you, you, can, you, can, you can collapse it, but you collapse it consciously. So for me, it's a place where one really has to start and then reconfigure. Mm. So that's how I, I kind of answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. It's brilliant. Uh, the three of you are just, uh, it's, it's remarkable to think of the different ways that we talk about abolition, freedom, collapsing, expanding, imagining. Um, during the, uh, the process with the curatorial ensemble, we talked a lot about the fact that we live within this space of the colonial imaginary. That's currently what we either decide to reside within or make a decision to imagine another way. And so perhaps with that intention, do you want to speak to the process of imagining that your work allows or creates? <laughs> Shall I speak this way? <laughs> <laughs> I just finished, so I feel like some other sound should happen. <laughs> um, I think that that's a good question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, answer it through the idea of process, right? So how do I? as an individual, work myself to silence, right? How do I, in the studio, create a condition where I am my absolute true self, right? And in that true self, make work that invents new pathways to my true self, right? So that assumes, and I have this practice called way over there inside me, so that assumes that my spell, myself is spacious. So my job right now, my practice, is to really explore the spaciousness of my true self and then activate that to, the, to I'll say, the exhaust the possibilities of the things that I know in that form. 
right? So it takes drawing and painting and writing all with the activity of exhausting the possibility of the things my mind will allow. And then laying that out, right, and doing it over and over and over again. And I think that that takes deep solitude. And then when it's presented to a public or my partner or my friends, it then becomes to, gets this sort of vibration happening. And then it's its own self. And then when, it's, when people respond to me with it, then I know if I really have, you know, asked the good question about who I am. And because that belonging is so deep and collective, um, but not universal, um, it really brings me pure euphoric joy when people who have no idea where, what is going on in that solitude space can feel something that takes them to a future, right? So that's that string of becoming, belonging, ongoing of blackness that I just have the deepest pleasure of existing in. You know, it's like that, so. If that makes sense, that, that future, present. I can Absolutely. Shall I go or do you want to go? I mean, I can go. The, uh, oh, I really like that you're saying finding your true self, because I think I tessellate between this idea of there's a, there's a yourself is two things. It's, it's how the world greets you when you're born, like the, like the myths that you're born into, man, woman, black, white, all of those things. And then as you get old, as you start to become self-aware, then you start to see, do, do you fit into these boxes? So most of your life is either fitting into those boxes or actively trying to break out of them, right? And so much of the time when we sit up here as, uh, as, as black, or we are black artists, you know? Like, and that, it, like, that's not something that people usually choose, it's just that that's what you, you give them when you sit, step in front of people. And we have to speak for, at least in my life, if I'm the only black person in the room and something, and the word black happens, everybody looks at me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when, when, I'm, when I'm in my studio and I'm trying to um, tap into my truest self, I try, to, I try to put all those things away, but I also know that I come from a, uh, just a history of people and, and the, the family that I come from, all of those things make up who I am. The environment, the environmental, um, it, the environmental attributes as well as what I got going on inside of me. So um, I agree with the idea like rigor and like it's, it's a workout every possible way I can get out an idea. And I think that as an artist, when, when we working through that, I don't, I have a hard time making it just, this is my own personal expression. I'm always thinking about, I'm having an active conversation with everyone else. And so I try to make things, um, when, when, or, or the things that I do present, I'm just, I'm, I'm just ready for it to be in the conversation of a, of a community aspect and community, uh, I guess, Activism is not the word, but just I know that I'm in, in, in conversation with people like me. So I like what you said about, um, or what I heard was, we make things that are are original, but they are familiar to those that are like us because of the, because of the familiarity that we have as Black people and uh, of the diaspora. There's a there's a universal at, at some point there's a universal understanding of what it means to be Black. But even though we are all individuals, and there's no one way to experience that life. There's a familiar, uh, a, a familiar feeling that we, that we get, if you can really tap in. And that's the future that, that, that we're building towards. At least that's what I'm trying to build toward. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to, to sort of have to wrestle with, um, I mean, it's funny. I, I was always scared to get to that point of joy that you, you speak about at the beginning. And for me, architecture was a way to avoid that. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of really fascinating. <laughs> I mean, to avoid that because to somehow give pleasure to yourself was seen to be completely the most decadent thing that I could do. And somehow it felt as though it was profligate or Catholic maybe, <laughs> you know? So um, it took me a long while to, to, to finally let go of that. And in a way, I think that my sort of early work really was about really this kind of concern with trying to 
find ways in which a kind of parallel state could occur. So in a way, do you, can you create sort of a symbiosis that has its own identity that d refuses a simulation, but has its own identity, but understands the construction of the world that you're in, right? So it was kind of like a struggle with you know, the mutations of that. But I think that it's sort of, um, as, as, it's sort of, as I've sort of grown a little bit older, I, I sort of have become just deeply in awe of the archive of black people, right? So, so it's just, and the idea, the responsibility, but not in any heavy way, but just, just the incredible pleasure, and that's where the pleasure has now come in, of being able to contribute to the archive of black people has just been just like euphoric. Mm -hmm. So for me, the search for like, what is that other move now in this archive? It's just become so pleasurable that it's, for me, I'm always like, almost like laughing in the studio when we sort of, when we kind of work through something or work through something and it sort of unfolds to a place where you say, oh my God, that is now telling me something. For me, that's what I was always looking for. It's when the work gets to the place where it starts to show you something that you didn't even know, even though it's coming through your body, right? And then that's when you know that it's like, okay, let's, let's, let's try and manifest that in the world. Yeah. I think that, um, your microphone, Turquoise, oh, sorry. sorry. When I watch that phenomenon of having a person, having a person make something and then learn from that thing, I think I, the first time I saw that and I knew kind of what it was, it was Cecil Taylor, right? So, oof. So he's doing Cecil Taylor and I'm watching him just on YouTube learn from that doing in real time and then applying it seconds later to the next thing. And so that sort of zone of mindfulness and brainness is something that I think I'm, I know that I can achieve with deep study of something, right? So. Or, or when I think about Mahalia and singing back to herself or, or, or even watching, like looking at a Mary Lovelace O'Neill painting, it's like, fuck, you know? So yeah, that is that kind of um, freedom and ancestorship and liveness that I think that um, like I'm interested in and I, I'm not even sure what is happening with architecture in, in my work right now, but I know it is insane. I'm not sure how someone chooses to spend their life dedicated to this, <laughs> to this thing. Um, but my completely, you know, painting is a super safe zone. You know what I mean? It's super, it's a super safe zone. So to cross over to even think about bodies occupying a space, I think in its, talking about DNA, in its construction of a thing, you're indelibly tied to what humans need, you know? But you jumped into it so seamlessly. I think oh. it's, <laughs> no, I, I, it's, 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 it's amazing to, I, what I really enjoyed about the work if I can just jump off, please. Is, is the way in which you were able to use narratives that are to do with mathematics and space into, into which is the kind of foundation of form making, mm -hmm. but to translate that into a form which is at once recognizable and completely disorientating. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was a kind of deep pleasure in being able to sort of recognize it, but also not know it. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of resonance was really, it was very magical. Thank you, Sir David Ajay. <laughs> what do you say to that? Do you want to engage with the idea of architecture and the body? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's rough too. We're not, but, <laughs> but, but what I do think that we all got in common, no matter what field, because I don't really, 
uh, designate, designate my practice to one thing, but I, I, I think of it as storytelling and in, and in, in, in culture building and, 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 uh, like you were saying, adding to the rich history of, of what blackness is and what black creativity is. So I think in that, in that regard, we are architects because it's like we're cultural architects. We're consciously making things to add to, to the landscape of, of the, the spiritual aspect of being black or the spiritual aspect of, of human existence. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I like to, when I'm thinking about architecture, because the numbers and the math, that's why I learned how to draw. You know what I'm saying? It was not my, my favorite thing to do, you know what I'm saying? So, so um, I, I have much more respect now after after this last <laughs> project for 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 what it takes to make something and to make sure it stays standing. Yes, I have a lot, I have a lot more respect uh, for that now. Uh, but I, but what I did learn is that I've been doing that my entire life with the things that I've been creating. Um, just not, I, I just wasn't accessing that skill set. In that way, I didn't think about it as that same skill set. So, so that's what that's what I'm taking from architecture. That you that you you take the materials you have around you and build something that shelters you and shelters other or others, whether it's uh, emotionally, mentally, physically, like that. You're building shelter. So that's what I think. Yeah, I think that's what what I like to take from from my small um, foyer into architecture and so forth. Just to add a little bit to that, because you just entered architecture, so I have to add a little bit into that. <laughs> um, that in a way, you know, there is a difference between construction and architecture, and and that architecture is is that moment past construction where the intention or the idea is the guiding principle of construction. It's the other way around. So, and 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 the reason why a temple is architecture is because it's all about the idea. It's nothing to do with practicality. I mean, there's some practical things you do in it, but it's completely a bizarre idea. So I think, you know, I think to always gauge when something is, when you're entering architecture, is when you're transforming ideas into form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about sculpture in the round? <laughs> in that? <laughs> Thank you for that question, Torquase. Yes. I just my sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> sculpture with a capital S. You know, like, it's a baby. This, no, really, thinking about um, your um, space and making objects in the round um, in this way in which it doesn't have um, a condition of containment necessarily or a form that thinks about enclosure and a kind of um, all overness, but uh, you know, sculpture that is a condition of really using um, or having no cap, no, no end point, no beginning, but is something in the round. Yeah. It's so hard if you really focus on it. I mean, it's very hard. It's very easy to gesturally do it, but it's so hard to move to the ovoid in the form because it, the whole world that we inhabit is constructed. It wasn't before, but it's now constructed using rectangles. So it's so hard to, to move there, unless if you just want to be contrarian, but to move there with intentionality and to then see that as a space that really starts to operate a completely different sort of uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sort of, for me, sculpture is a great sort of immersion into really starting to fully be conscious about what the ramifications of those things are. So in a way, for me, um, the sculpture that I'm sort of, the sculpture that I made at uh, the social show and, and its second variation, which is, really just this unfolding really is is trying to put myself outside and inside of this idea of of this ovoid and to try and and to try not just to be um assumptive about it at all and and so how do you you know the problem with the the problem with the ovoid is that it's also the most familiar form to our bodies right so so there's a lot of overreading um, so how do you how do you then how do you slow down that overreading and how do you just take time to really understand the kind of power of it? Um, and, and so 
in a way for me, slicing it <laughs> was a kind of very violent act, but one that was necessary for me to start to kind of unfold it, you know, to just, I just, I couldn't quite make it yet. Yeah. yeah. It seemed like interesting, this idea of the extrusion of form, right? Of being sort of... Torquoise, I am so sorry to interrupt, sorry. but... We have I apologize. Um, <clears throat> thinking of geometry as these extrusions that operate across space and the idea of, of um, symbiosis, right? And when I think about that in a contemporary sculptural form, I oftentimes think, think about the politics, of course, of environmental justice, environmental liberation, and acts of like how do we understand the world now in a uh, condition of desensitizing sensoria? Like how do you push towards sensoria? And this sort of bifurcation and extrusion of these forms, in my mind, the way that the eye moves, right, and the cones in my, sorry, the way the cones in my brain follow light, I'm hopping, right? I'm moving right across it. So yeah, in, in my imagination, this sort of movement happens in, in, that, in that sculptural proposition. Sculptor. <laughs> and I think in, in that sense of time, uh, David, I think you have to catch a flight. I unfortunately have to catch a plane, so so sorry. But we're gonna continue so the conversation. Yes, thank when, you so much. Thank you. So there's, there, there's some commonalities within the dialogue that we just had that are cyclical, that are really anchored to histories that are embedded in blackness, broadly, expansively, uh, call and response, syncopation, circularity. And I really appreciated early on, Torquoise, when you were talking about learning from Keith, because Mindy and Keith also weren't supposed to be here today. They, their flight was canceled, but I, but I, but what I really enjoyed about the St. Louis Place relationship to your works in that space is that there is this kind of call and response, and I wonder if I can ask you all to talk about that in in dialogue, and also situate it within the deep community work you've been doing for four years with your sculpture because we're talking about community engagement on very different registers in St. Louis. Can we bring up another chair? There's a chair right there, yeah. But there's two of them. Yes, oh, no, there's an extra chair right there. Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> yeah. So Is that OK? Come on down. <laughs> this was my plan. And if you all, um, I can pass the mic down. <laughs> I hilarious. sure will. <laughs> oh, I see what's happening. Got it. I got it. That's right. All right. Well, now Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I've known. <laughs> oh, we've known each other a very long time. A very long time, yes. <laughs> so it's, it's beautiful to be here. With, with all of your projects and to be in conversation with Allison. Uh, this has been great. And uh, it's been wonderful for us working in the St. Louis Place community. And not, on, not only getting to know the site uh, and the people who live in the community, but also the artists across St. Louis. And so for us, I mean, we really just tried to make our, our dialogue with the community and with the artists specifically audible. And so that's really what our, pro our project is called Slow Drag. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we tried to make it audible and, and kind of reinscribe those relationships through sound. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? That's is that it. accurate? That's okay. And I think, oh, Torquoise, please. Oh, no. So when I, um, 
the, the first time I understood what was happening with Mindy and Keith and the way they thought about space and sound, I don't know, it was in 20, when was that? When, when? 2001? Yeah, 2001, yeah. Oh, 2001. And the way in which they were thinking about space and sound and storytelling and communication, and, and I had never, like, physically and, and even in my imagination seen um, two people create such an experience for multiple people. Right. So when I heard that um, Keith and Mindy were going to do something for Counter Public, I knew that it was going to be spatial. People were going to move their bodies. There was going to be some kind of inventive sound, sonic, you know, cinematic um, condition happening. And so yesterday, um, because their piece was um, sort of this mobile, um, I don't, I don't even know what to really call it. Procession. Because it procession, wasn't a parade, it was. I thought it was kind of even beyond a procession, right? Because when I think about the cars, and I'm from Chicago, maybe it's that, yeah, it was slow drag. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing where I was like, wow, what did I say yesterday? The troops have arrived. Yeah, that's what you said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I right? think the formulation of the vehicles, the people in the vehicles, their faces, their intention, their flags, their order. It was such a powerful condition to experience one after another, like moving down the street. And I just felt a presence. And I, and I felt like there was um, identity there, like a really strong sense of identity. And I thought it was a radical way to produce and, and display identity in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. So I just felt um, safe and I felt um, protected. It's, it's like one of those things when people, you know, show up, you know, in order. It was just, it was yeah. fantastic. Pull up a motorcade. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, Jamin, with, with regard to your work and how the sculptures are going to be developing over time, right? There is also this sense of continuity, time, procession, deep engagement with community. So I love, like my, my intention here, this was not meant to happen, is really to have this dialogue about yeah. deep engagement with community and what that looks like in what ways and how your work is really pointing to that and how your work is, I mean, all of your work is pointing to that. Yeah. And and specifically with these, this project, a lot of... Some, I've learned to compartmentalize a lot of things. Um, you know, one from being black, you gotta do that to, to mentally survive. But as far as my practice, um, like this, was, this, this project, I heard about something that happened in a place that I was from that I didn't know about. And I want to make sure no black kid ever grew up like that again. Not knowing that there was a community here that, that existed and they, they would never be forgotten again, right? And so that, that, that ain't really me going through my own internal struggles, because I didn't live, that, that, like, I didn't make this for me, I made it for my folks and for my people that, that's from here. And so that was my main intention, to have a conversation with that, the, those ancestors and, and, and the descendants that come come later. And so while doing that, um, I had a lot of help from uh, Great Rivers Greenway, but I but I, I got to meet the, the these elders that were children that lived there. And just by listening to them, one, it, it, again, the familiarity. It was it was super familiar, you know. They 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 sound like uh, my aunts and my uncles, the people that raised me, and and I was just trying to pay attention and soak up as much as possible. And one specific thing that I wanted to do was make sure their words were cut into this stone, mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't it would never go away. And and when 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 you see the inscriptions inside of the pillars, those are actual quotes from people. And I want to make sure too. That it wasn't all good shit, and it wasn't all bad things, and it was it, it it was a it was a tapestry of what it was like to 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 live there because we usually one uh, again the 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 stereotypes and there's ideas about what it is to be black that's always portrayed, and then we get caught up in trying not to do that and make sure that we don't ever show the negative. And I, but that was not my goal. My goal is to show the whole thing, the the complexity of black life, and specifically the the, the complexity of black life in that specific neighborhood. So so um, it's been one of the most fulfilling projects I've ever done, is, is talking to these people and gathering these histories. And it, and it um, 
Yeah, like, like, and, it, and, and again, it's an ongoing thing. And in physical space, when we talk about procession, it is a, it's a literal procession down the street. Like, we start with one capstone, and we keep making these until it ends at, at Harris Stowe. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a physical walk down the street that, that the pieces do. Um, and it's a, it's, since it's a mile long, it's not even close to what this neighborhood was, but it, but, but at least it's a, it's a start and it's a, uh, it's an altar to these people and these, and these, and these, these histories and the, and these, the, the, the spiritual energy that still exists here. So, um, that was that was my focus to make sure that we made an altar that didn't move for these people and 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 uh and it's also an idea that that if we can do that for them then uh there's there's a lot of other there's a lot of other histories that's been forgotten not just black people the natives it's a whole lot of people that's been taken from for this country to exist and so it's about time for those histories to be acknowledged because that's what makes this place what it is yeah. I've been um, listening, uh, and and you know, it, the things that you said, and also David, who's not here, um, have been reminding me of a of a question that I have about my own work, and just hearing you all talk about it, you know, it's just, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, I've I've come to think about our work as being um, stewards of the culture. Right, but stewards, I think in the past, I thought of that as someone who um, all the words I'm going to say, I, I have new mean, new understandings of, right? So steward is a word I have a new understanding of. I was going to say remembers the culture, but or I was going to say just remembers the culture or just keeps things the same, but realizing that as I, as I mature in my practice and age in my life. Um, that those things are very active and creative acts. You know, like you were talking about keeping these words of the people, but like nobody is thinking about that like in, like you are, right? And it takes your creativity to even keep something, you know, going. Uh, to Kwase, sitting in your piece yesterday, I remember being in your studio your first year at Yale. <laughs> and looking at your landscape paintings. And I was like, that's what she was talking about. That's how I was supposed to be looking at the sky. She was saying that in 2001, but I wasn't inside it. You know what I mean? Like, I just, it took this long for her to make the thing that I could get inside so I could see the sky in that way, you know? And like, the sky has been there, right? <laughs> you know, your perspective on some of the things you want us to think about looking at and, and being in dialogue with other artists. You know, that's been there, but um, it takes your creativity and, um, and, 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 and lots of support and lots of time and lots of people to like see you for us to have that um, um, view on what we're supposed to be in dialogue or remember even, you know. Um, and that, you know, that's been so moving to me um, to see with my dear, dear friend for many years and from somebody I'm just meeting, you know, um, just to realize this thing that we're all a part of. Um, and through that, through all of us, that remembering takes um, each of us and it takes um, an active, you know, kind of creativity um, to, to produce. Can I add one thing to that, what I heard? Because I, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm about to contradict myself, okay? So I just said, I compartmentalize, and I do, right? But there's no way not for your personal fingerprint to come across on things, um, wh whether you do it like, though, though those are their quotes, I'm, I'm picking parts of things, to, I'm, I'm curating, I'm directing. And so even in that, but um, I think David said something about just genetic memory and idea. And so like every time somebody touches something, right? You, you, you've you added to this this huge um, being, like, 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 this, the, like this living organism that, that is the, the, the spirit of, of 
of blackness or whatever, or, or even on a on a broader note, the, the spirit of what it is to be a human being. And so, so I think that even though um, we compartmentalizing things, or or we're we're stewards, or or we're being we're being charged to be scribes for for the time period that we are in, because that's what artists do. We kind of when you look back, the only reason we know about a lot of these fallen empires is because the art that was left behind. It's the the statues and the buildings and stuff like that that was cut into it. Each artist is also, with with their personal signature, adding, yeah, yeah, leave, leaving their DNA on it too. Even if they just writing down somebody, an autobiographer or whatever, like you still leave, leaving your personal way of looking at it. And so I think that that, it's always a community conversation, no matter what's going on, no matter how you know individualistic you want to make being an artist, it's still a community conversation. It's a community conversation, but I was also struck by you were talking about your interest in materials and I think how that changed over time as you learn things and, yeah. and as you experimented with different things and Tequase talked about, excuse me, I've got gum, <laughs> the, same, <laughs> the same sort of thing, right? And so, yes, you're, you're like in dialogue with the community, you're sort of going into yourself and you're having this kind of dialogue with the material, right? And all those things shift over like five years, right? So, so that's, that's a lot of time for like development and, and that, and that gets recorded also in the piece, right? Yeah. I think this idea of community conversation is a really great moment to open up to questions from the audience. Okay, I see a question up there. I think we're gonna bring a mic to you. Okay. Right on. What's up, Lanny? How you doing, brother? <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think that the hardest thing to do is to make things simple. You know what I mean? Especially um, when I looked up the when I was a younger artist, I used to think that um, you know the bigger the words in the rap, the smarter I looked. It, it was really a big exercise in ego a lot of times, and 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 I. Um, and even in settings like this, I feel and with white walls, it's very sterilized. It's very, it, it speaks to who, who it's talking to. And it's not talking to common people a lot of times. These spaces are very intimidating to, to, to working class people, black people, that at least the, 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 the place that I grew up at. I did not feel like this was something for me. Um, I didn't think uh, b before, um, and it took, it took a lot of personal drive for me to believe that I could be a fine artist because I didn't see any examples of that, right? And so a lot of times the art that really resonated with me, one, and, and, and the stuff that was uh, available to me was uh, TV, cartoons, stuff like that, but also like religious stories, mythology, right? And, and, and the things that seem um, childish, that I, I really like the idea of parables, si simple stories that, that could be interpreted in, in many different ways. And so I try to, uh, uh, apply that idea to whatever I'm doing so that it's accessible to as many people as possible because I, I started to learn that if the, the simpler it is, the more people if the more people can understand whether they speak the language, whether they whether they uh, come from the same place, whatever, if the, the more people you can get through to is kind of the goal, especially if, if I'm in conversation with other people. Now, now, when I'm doing stuff for myself, I still think that the, the, the more true I am to myself, the more I can distill myself down to um, the most basic elements, then that the more, the more micro you get, the more macro the story is. Because the, 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 small, the, the more in tune you are to who you are and, and the thing that you're trying to say, somebody will find something in it that they, that they resonate with. So I try to keep my stuff as simple as possible. Um, for, for me so that I can, one, so that I can understand it and so that I know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and if I can understand it, then I think I'm, I'm, I, um, I think somebody along the way will find something in it. And so that's the stuff that I'm most proud of and that's the stuff that I try to um, make when I'm trying to be in conversation with community. Uh, 
thanks all of you for um, your words. Um, I was going to actually ask this to the curatorial group before, but I think it actually applies really well to this group too. Um, the balance between permanence and temporariness and um, permanence sometimes can be something that's used to push against um, counter publics um, and some communities that have been marginalized, but sometimes permanence is something to sort of establish an infrastructure that can be sustainable to support communities. And on the other side, like temporary nets can be something that can be sensitive to the problematics of things being permanent. Um, but on the other hand, a small gesture um, can potentially have a relationship to sustainability that's different than permanence. So my question is, how have each of you thought about that tension in relationship to the communities that you direct in your projects? Mindy and Keith, do you want to start with that? And we'll just go down. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and I, some yeah. This is what I'll say. This is what I'll say about what I think. Some of it I will not say. Some of it I will say. Uh, what I will say... <laughs> what I will say is that, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've been really investigating is... Um, the way that um, the ephemeral um, elements of our work, which include sound, but are not uh, contained by, I, mean, I don't know if anything is just contained in sound, but, but that, that, don't, that are not limited to the sonic elements. Um, we're thinking about the ways that those elements um, are part of our inheritance, um, what it means to direct attention to those elements, and um, what it takes to give space to those elements. I will also say that um, recently, for me personally, I've been thinking about um, just who we, what it is to be alive um, and knowing that those who have transitioned out of this plane of existence are not gone is really important that we um, refine our sensibilities for those things that are not material. Um, and so um, that is what I'm meditating on right now. I think, you know, I'll, I'll echo a lot of what Mindy said and I think we think a lot of our work as artists is to invite the public to question what we think of as permanent and impermanent. A lot of our work is about using invisible things to point at other invisible things and to make you sort of notice their presence around you. So that's it. I'm interested in the idea of world building with the material engineering and the science of objects that are meant to fail and meant to continue. So there needs to be um, in the tradition of um, I think East African nomadic traditions of world building into the plan of ongoingness there's materials that we understand that will fail, and there were materials that we understand that will um, sort of be in use for a long period of time. So this idea of, um, of the ephemeral, temporary, ongoing, or long-term has to have some kind of new relationship with world building in the, tra in the tradition of both, um, I think, nomadic, the tradition of nomadic people, the tradition of a kind of uh, a pagan ritual of being in the tradition of um, indigenous ways, that, that's what I think. And I think that, that the radical move of ongoingness is to really figure out how to, to um, manifest that right now. You know, no, like, oh, we need to figure the, no, we understand what it is. It's just the people that have invented and lived this way have been dispossessed and have been erased, right? So what is the job of 
um, this question of art and ongoingness or community and ongoingness. It doesn't make sense to think about, to me, um, to think really rigidly around what does it mean to um, continue um, a racial capital condition that works with dispossession in infrastructure that's toxic, right? So, I mean, I understand the question, um, but I also understand the answer is in a history um, that capital continues to erase. Um, so in my mind, that's the work. That is the absolute sort of work is really decolonizing um, what capital and racial capital and global capital has done because people are still doing it, right? People are still living this way and we are connected in networks that are both ephemeral and both kind of permanent. And also Amir Baraka talks about sometimes you don't say it out loud, <laughs> right? Sometimes you just don't say it out loud. So um, I'm interested in that way, um, you know, of being, because I'm, I am, by my spirit, my Obatala head is very nomadic. You know, there is no sense of landing. It's very sort of movement oriented. Like I'm, a, my friend calls me a squirrel. So if you can imagine how it is a squirrel activating, you know. So it needs to be room for all of us. And I think that, you know, indigenous and African practice and, you know, paganistic, but we have that. I, I think in my work, permanence, impermanence, I think I, I am trying to solve a problem. And so I use whatever tool is at my disposal at that point. So that's what I'm thinking about. What, what is the story of the problem that I'm trying to alleviate? And then specifically with Pillars of the Valley, it was about people that didn't get to permanently do what they wanted to do. And, they, and like, so, so their time did end in a place without their choice. So to, do, to counteract that, I went in the opposite direction to make something as permanent as I could possibly make it. Stone, like cutting stone pillars in the street that wouldn't move, that at least outlast me in my lifetime. You know what I'm saying? So, but, but depending upon what situation it is, like, but we, we all understand that none of this, the sun gonna burn out, you know, I don't wanna get too depressing. But, but it, nothing is forever. <laughs> Not, nothing lasts forever, right? Right, so, I, and, and, and I think that one of the, the, the trappings of, the, of Western ideology and capitalism is trying to, uh, the great, great men that live forever and cut them into the side of mountains. And, I, and like, not like none of that, that, that ideology has, pro, has proven toxic and is destroying us, right? So um, that's, not, that's not the idea that I, I, I was trying to convey with, with my monument, but I did want to but back at that idea that, that but, but we don't never get to be permanent, right? We get herded and around while these other people get to just take whatever they want. So for one sing, like for one moment, we take up as much space as possible, like in, 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 in the center of the city that these people help build. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like they, they help build this thing, this great thing, and then they get swept under the rug. So I just want to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. And so that's why I was trying to make my thing as permanent as possible, but th that was the goal. That was the, that, that was the thing I was addressing. So depending upon whatever whatever the next problem to, to solve, maybe it, maybe it's a, maybe it's about breaking up the idea of permanence. And so then then I then I get as as transient as I possibly can. So it's, it depends on what the objective is for me. Can I can I say something to that? What's so great about that condition of um, choice and um, being able to choose permanency and impermanency is another African practice. So tribes were to, their function was to respond to the land and move other people who were long-termers, right? So you have people who were built in this nomadic tradition, and then that would help other people who wanted to keep the condition of permanency, right? So that's the sort of discursive condition of being alive. And how do we do that with the technology and the ways of being and what we know and what we've created and the, 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 the condition of extraction, right? So. I really am concerned about um, this idea of ongoing extraction and dispossession as it pertains to choice, because I think that these moments of permanency can allow people to exhaust the possibilities of their humanness. 
right? And when that is disrupted without their will and without their, that is a, you know, a, um, you, that, that's the way in which you perper perpetuate insanity, right? Because chaos can perpetuate that kind of insanity. And I think that's the terrorism that black people have been under since the beginning. You don't have any control. They can come in at any time. They're moving you around. They, they, or they, to spill they, it. Yeah. What is love? Yeah. 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 see another question up there. Um, uh, hello, I have a question regarding, there was a conversation earlier on architecture and permanence and capitalism, and then you just mentioned like the nomad and like how there are kind of different elements and different flows in the world now and in the past and like where you place yourself. I'm really curious about the current times we're in and the current situation we're in where not everyone and not all communities have the ability to be nomads. And there are some spaces that are being attacked that the permanence is trying to be uprooted and extracted. And so I'm curious of how you guys find those spaces to exist within where we are in a more sterile space or we're in cities that there are more safer for people to put permanence and to like recognize history. I'm just curious like what your thoughts are now in the current times of when that's kind of being attacked and uprooted in certain spaces of community. Well, uh, let me... Sorry, what was the end of that? Um, how that is being attacked. This idea of permanence and rootedness is being continuously attacked. And I want to um, draw on what the brother was just talking about and what Hortense Spillers continues to, this permanency and impermanency and this idea of vulnerability and community vulnerability is really attached to, and I hate to bring it up again, capital. Like how, in, in the history of what I'm, what I'm, talking about is in a kind of history based on extraction, exploitation, distribution, um, and what, before dis distribution, I'll say storage and distribution. So this ways in which we get to decide where our homesteads are, or where our community gardens are, or where our stores are, where our barter conditions are, where our schools are, where our prayer spaces are, all of that strength is in sociality, without a doubt. From sociality becomes education, it becomes sharing, it becomes skill sharing, and becomes mindfulness to exhaust those possibilities. What racial, I'll say racial uh, slavery and uh, racial capitalism does, it insists that these systems create perpetual conditions of chaos. And that is in relationship to capital, where you're talking about a community that is dispossessed because of a highway that's coming in, um, eminent domain, whether that's a hospital that's defunded because of the rise in pharmaceuticals. So the, the, the network of um, dispossession and um, displacement is so seeded in this country because of genocide, we would really have to do an overhaul, a radical overhaul to even get at your question. Because your question in itself is a discursive one, right? So when people talk about, okay, well, how do you think about what's happening today? There is no happening today without the slow violence, Rob Nixon, the slow violence of continued extraction, right? So how I feel about it is, is how do you feel about being a, a, in a spinning ball that you can't control and it's not your fault? You know, you try to hold on to the thing that's next to you, you try to honor the things that came before you, and you do every minute of the day try to decolonize that, that space, right? So, I mean, we're all doing our bits, right? We're all doing our bits, and as, as an artist, I'm trying to, you know, figure out this idea of the nomadic so I can understand what it feels like to get off the grid and be agile and build Studio South Zero so I can, who, who am I to insist that people who want to stay, stay? And then who am I to insist that people who want to be nomadic are nomadic? Um, but you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's such a complicated, um, it's a complicated, thing to undo, but it's a very clear 
solution, right? It's a very clear solution, and it has to do with understanding that humanity has um, a right to be to not be universal and still be alive and well and thrive. Mindy or Keith, do you wanna take a stab at that question? I was just thinking about things that Damon said earlier about you know being born into a place that is violent, but um, um, making it because of the work and the choices of people before you, right? Um, that's part of our inheritance. You know, um, I don't think I know a time that wasn't violent, you know, or, or, but that doesn't mean, I remember, I remember in 2002 or thereabouts, you introduced me to Leslie Hewitt and we went to her studio and she said something like she said, I don't, I don't remember what we were looking at. We were looking at something she made, but she said, I, I made this because the work we tend to make about people who were enslaved is about pain and violence, but the work that those people made, the art that those people made was not. And I was like, I've been thinking about that for, you know, for 20 years. It's like, okay, there's a lesson in that, That's right. you know? And so that for me, you know, that's what are the lessons that I have already been exposed to and trying to extract those, you know, from my own memory and experience, you know? Well, I, you know, I want to go back. I mean, I want to go back to this question of permanence and impermanence because that, that relates to this. I mean, part of our culture is Igbo culture. And in Igbo culture, there's this practice of building embaris, all right? So when, when a community has gone through something difficult, uh, an artist is called in. Uh, to to build an embari, it's a, it's a shrine. It's also a museum, and and it's both permanent and impermanent, right? So, it exists forever in some way because it's dedicated to the earth, but it the artist builds it with the community. And it, it exists for a short time, and then it decays, and the decay is part of it. And then when you need another one, you commission a new embari, right? And so that's about remembering, remembering the spirits, the artist helps, helps us remember. And then it decays and you do it again. So that's the work, yeah. I mean, I'm loving everything everybody said. Like, I, 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 I think the whole thing is about choice. That's what freedom is. I get to choose to stay here. Or I get to choose to leave, right? And that's something that, that is rarely allowed to us. And, that, and, and I think that if you know when I, I hear people talk about like like gentrification and stuff like that, and it'd be the people coming in that's talking about gentrification. You know what I'm saying? It's the people that's coming in, moving the people out, talking about gentrification, and they and and and, and the language changes for every generation. Now it's gentrification. You know what I'm saying? It'll change into something else later. But the 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 thing is, is to like give the people. Like share, I don't, like I, I, as simple as I can put it is like leave leave people alone. You know what I'm saying? Just, yeah, just leave. If you want to move around, you move around. If I want to stay right here, I'm, I want to stay right here. But it's always it's people trying to validate the stuff that they finna do to get their own. You know what I'm saying? And, and and then though and 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 pontificating on what what you know is 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 horror and what you know is wrong. You know what I'm saying? And that and that's the thing that that America got to keep doing generation after generation and forget what they do and naming and naming it something else you know what i'm saying but it's the it's the same thing and and and, and it's like all of this well you we, have to keep yeah. fortifying white supremacy yeah. something that doesn't it, make sense something that doesn't hold up you right, know what i'm that saying because it's so thin yeah. right if you were to take away the conditions um of white supremacy and really think about what does it mean to exchange in humanity, in invention, and in, uh, the possibilities of being, and think about class and real poverty yeah. and the body as work, 
you, you have to fortify the thing that keeps the violence and the horror in the individual and the fear from the other, yes. like otherwise, right? So then that, that we who have to think about that otherwise, you know, are, are in that other yeah. ways in the, in the imagination, understanding the fragility of, um, in this country, white, white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the paradox, the, the fragility, but the insistence and the ongoingness of the powers that keep it tied so tight. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm hearing you say is existing under the conditions of occupation, right? Because that's essentially the conditions we exist within in this country. Yeah, yeah. Since, the, since we got here, you know what I'm since saying? Before. Yeah, since before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we can bring in Cedric Robinson and talk about, you know, racism was not established here, but it was established in Europe in, yeah. in itself. And a set of um, a colonial Europe was happening before a global colonial condition happened. So it, but, you know, so, yeah. Well, we could keep going. Yeah. Oh, sorry. But I feel like <laughs> it's a, an but, odd time yeah. to, to thank you all for your care and generosity. Yeah.